yeah, for sure. I mean, who knows what to say in that situation? I mean. So I've been talking um, a lot this week about what we learn and how to, what we learn about race and racism and how to talk about it is in the silence of it and what's unspoken and, um, and what's inferred from watching the response, reaction, attitude, behavior. And that's how we learn. So as I ask people to share your story of how you got to, you know, live where you are at this very moment, where are your people from? How did you get here? Who, where, what, how did you navigate school? Who are you around? And what most people will say is we didn't talk about it. Well, sure you did. It was screaming volumes of what you didn't talk about that was unsaid or unspoken. And that's how you learn that, ooh, uh, ooh, it's better to be, it's better to be white because look how that, look how they got treated here. Oop, it's better to, to move across the street now. Oh, look, my mom did this or my dad did that. And it's not to point out anybody's blame or shame. It's that we're held hostage by that. That's how we're harmed. That's how racism harms us all is we're held hostage by this invisible, unspoken, these rules and constructs that you know, move and navigate us in a way that is against what we're experiencing or seeing in a way that we know is wrong. Yeah. But we're held hostage and over that barrel of, oops, we might lose our, 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 our parents to take care of us or disown us or we'll lose our livelihood. I might lose my home. I'll lose my friends. Oh no, what will I do if I be true to what I know is right and, and humane? So yeah. silence is deadly yeah. and the truth is we will lose stuff i mean mm -hmm. I, I and and i think that that's another piece of well i think that's another piece of being being in the in this fight is being willing to lose the things that you're going to lose i mean i i think there are jobs that i don't get i think there i i just think there are things that don't come to me now because of the stance i'm willing to take and mm -hmm. that's fine that's mm -hmm. That's you what, get, that's you get to be and show up with your full true self instead of having to right. hide your part of you behind a box or a pole or in a in a condition that you can't even operate from. That's right. And then I get to have and then I get to have relationship, authentic relationship too. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't mm -hmm. otherwise... and, and part of that losing things is is a grieving process. I mean, we've all got to lose, you know, part of our identity of who we even thought, you know, America was, our American yeah identity and you know I ask folks a lot of times what's the what's the biggest lie that you have held on to about you know the American dream or American identity like who gets to be American when are you American enough and who says you know you get to be uh, American what does that look like and so um, those identities and those things that you are told this is the dream, but you see the reality of this is this is not the dream. This is the picture they want you to believe and hold up. But wait a minute, look behind the curtain. Oh, that was one of our students. Uh, her zinger line said that um, the pandemic has um, shown America's big magic trick, and that they we get to see behind the curtain like the Wizard of Oz and um, see all of this orchestrating that is, you know, in this con you know our made up way that we exist in the world and uh, harm each other. Mm -hmm. You know, I just going back to a couple of things you said for now that really got me thinking, um, number one, the silence or what happens in our homes, you know, because we are all educators at some level, um, Fresnel and I, K-12, but Dr. Self at, in higher ed, we're all educators. Um, I have come to believe more and more and more the older I get, the more people are watching our actions more than what we say. And so I just, I'm, I'm always thinking about what are we modeling for our children? What are we modeling for the children around us? Um, what are we modeling even as educators about what is important and, and how powerful that modeling is? And I think about that little guy and how quick he was to say, are you calling me a racist? Right. And I thought, wow, at eight years old, I would not have known that term at all. And, and what that tells me is there have been some conversations in his house about this that um, <coughs> are not healthy, obviously, because I never brought up race. And, um, and I just found it really interesting that that was where he went 
um, right away. And so obviously there are some messages and, and what, going back to, you know, who's American and what is America, I think I've always known the truth about America because I, I started here and then left here and came back here. And so I've been able to see America, I think, for more of its true self than a lot of people. Um, but the awakening for me is my neighborhood. Like, I thought my neighborhood was a safe place, right? Mm -hmm. And so that was the peeling away of, you know, I thought if I went outside my neighborhood, that's where the danger was. But the danger was literally right down the street. Um, and all that being said, I now have this opportunity as an educator and a neighbor to show up differently for that little guy and his family. And um, I mean, I've been avoiding his house. So Dr. Self is going to come walk with me next week past their house intentionally. But um, but I, I have every hope that I will build a relationship with that little guy. Because here's my thing. I mean, as a teacher, I and Dr. Self, well, we're all athletes. So all of us understand yeah. that we're all competitors. Sorry, I forgot where I was for a hot second. But <laughs> you all should know that See, all of us are like high it, right? level. All of us right. have this history of high level athletic competition. So we are all competitors, all three of us on this <laughs> podcast. But um, I love, give me a competition, right? And so right now, this for me is like, okay, this little man, he's going to become my friend. So like, I am determined. And I was like that as a classroom teacher, that little kid that gave me a hard time. On, and I taught middle school. So y'all, if you have not been around middle school children, <laughs> then they give you lots of opportunities. You'd be jealous. <laughs> They're a little bit crazy. But I was that teacher that, okay, okay, little man, you're going to give me a hard time. I will, I'm going to find a way to figure out what you like. And, and I have decided that with this little guy, I'm just going to be watching him from a distance. I remember his name. I will be calling him by his name. Um, and I'm going to be watching him. Yeah. I haven't figured out yet exactly how I want to reach him, but I am determined to not avoid him. I'm determined to not avoid him and to push in and to get to know this little boy, because here's the thing, he will at some point be 12 and 14. And at some point he will likely have my husband as a teacher. That's the other truth about this is there's a good chance that he will end up having my husband at some point. Um, Cause there's one high school in our neighborhood and my husband teaches at it. And um, the chances of him having my husband for either history or English are pretty high. And so I see that as an investment in my community too. It's not just about me. It's mm -hmm. about the other black children that live around him and families. Him. That, right. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like I have an obligation, not just for my own well-being, <clears throat> but for everyone in our and for him and for him, because mm -hmm. he has been sold a lie right. about people who look like me. And, um, and it's obvious to me that they don't have black friends because Otherwise, I would not be invisible. I've literally walked by their house at least once a day since March 15th. At least once a day. Like, there's no way. Y'all in the podcast can't see me, but I'm six feet tall with a giant red afro. There's no way that you cannot see me, except what I know to be true is when you don't have authentic relationship with black and brown people, they are invisible to you. And there's all kinds of research about that, that people are invisible to you until you see them as individuals. And so I am determined with that family. They will know who I am. Mm -hmm. And not because of this incident, but because I'm determined, somehow we're gonna wrangle them in. I don't know how yet. I need some <laughs> wisdom on that, but it's gonna happen at some point. Well, that's why we show up in spaces like these to have the conversations like these and talk about all the things like these because this is where people get stuck on on their social media and facebook that you know somebody will say something and then ah, i'm just going to delete you or block you or whatnot and then gosh then they're going to turn up in my feed and then my neighborhood and then and so w w if we don't get each other we don't attempt to win each other to work with each other to see each other help each all of that then because th that's our world that's where we're stuck. Yeah. So when are we going to start seeing each other? So yeah. start with start with who's hardest for you to see. Let's go. For sure. That's one of the things to, to return to your question about um, allyship or solidarity, Aaron, that I see so often in white, um, in communities where white people are trying to do social justice work that especially among, like sometimes among white queers is this 
this this cancel culture of like oh if you're if you're not doing this this racial justice work right in the white queer community then you're do I'm done with you I'm like you know we cannot white people cannot cancel other white people because our work is with white people <laughs> like we have to be doing that work and that's that's where we're doing it and so like we can't just throw away another white person because that's someone we have to go reach and like bring them on over and help them not be racist and not be colluding with that um and it's that frustrates me so deeply when i when i see that happening so often this distancing so recommendation for y'all we're trying to figure this whole podcast thing out but my recommendation for how we go out is that for now who kicked us off what's your final your final word what's your final word Dr. Final? So, and then me okay mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the pocket the ally the show up the presence it's being present in the moment all of these um you know incidences the conversations, the social media, everything can be swirling around you like a tornado. But if you are not present first for yourself, within yourself, to even be open and aware, to engage in an opportunity to be an ally, you're going to miss it. That's why your, your, your blindness or the ignorance continues is because you're not present with yourself to even see somebody else. And so that's the the piece I want people to just, who are you? Who are your people? where did you come from? What are you about? How did you get here? And, and, and stop pointing at everybody else, but like, like point at you, like, who, who am I? Let me get in touch with who I am and be present so I can show up in a way that helps somebody else be their most full and truest self. So get present, be there, be in your own pocket first, and then let's go. <laughs> so, good. so good yeah 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 when you were talking about the pocket and what you just said for now i'm talking about the pocket um it reminded me of uh russ wilson and and him being in his and how he talks about being in the pocket in football is like when he's in there he says time slows down like he slows down time and he's able to see the whole field in this way mm -hmm. that just slows everything down and makes everything he's bigger present. and more yeah and he's just so present and he and he's able to hit the receivers in ways that um in ways that i think you know lots of other quarterbacks haven't been able to achieve just because they don't have that same presence mm -hmm. and i think i think about what you're saying and um and and i think of that of like that just like constantly bringing forward myself into moments where maybe I don't know what to do or maybe I don't know what to say or maybe I don't know what's next but if I can bring myself present and I can bring myself into that moment mm -hmm. and breathe and look maybe I can slow down everything enough to just to witness to be present to be there to receive and and to be part of whatever's going to happen next Yes, yes, and respond instead of react. Nice. Awesome. Beautiful. I think I would end by saying that for me, this whole experience is my reminder, and I say this a lot when I'm speaking, that I can't ever do anything great by myself anyway. So just my reminder that asking for help is just how we're, we're, meant, to, we're meant to do life together with other people. And so... Mm -hmm that you know don't try to go through trauma by yourself or walk through tough situations by yourself because you probably aren't going to do well and that's not doesn't make you weak or less than it that's just how right. we roll and that's what friends are about is friends show up for each other and they show mm -hmm. up in the pocket and they show up in person and that's what great friends do and then the other thing that as i think about this particular situation that's so important to me and it's another thing that i talk about a lot is we are never gonna get beyond us versus them until we choose intentionally to engage people who are different. And it's why I'm so committed to engaging this particular family, because I know if I still remain as that big black lady, <laughs> right? And they are that family and we don't ever build some sort of bond, 
I don't have hope for the future. Like the hope for my future is that I have to step in and be a bridge. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I just know that's what I was created for was to be a bridge. And so not everyone can do that, but it's what I know I was wired for this. And so if I'm going to tell other people, step out of your comfort zone, go talk to that person that doesn't agree with you, then how dare I not also do the same thing. Right. And I, I tell people when you're a bridge, sometimes you get walked on with heels. Like yeah. bridges get walked on and sometimes with heels. And this Ooh. was a heel experience, right? Yeah. Um, Say that. <laughs> but I gotta still be a bridge. Even if there are heels walking across me, um, the reality is I'm still holding two sides. And um, sometimes it hurts and sometimes it's such a beautiful thing to watch that community develop across difference. And so that is my hope for this moment. Yeah, that's where and we get our healing is with each other. We have to go to those hard places to get that healing. Can't do it by ourselves. Yep. Yeah, so, well, lady, thank you. Thank you all so much for thank being my, my, my community, part of my, my, my circle, my circle mm -hmm. in my pocket. <laughs> I hope we Love got all. all the things in this week's podcast. <laughs> we got to at least some of those things. <laughs> next week, more. There's more things, <laughs> more things, things. next week. <laughs> Stay tuned. <laughs> thank you, guys. Thank you.